Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paula Shapiro, and I'm the Associate Director of the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. Welcome to the inaugural webinar of our newly launched Rapid Response Project. A major focus of this year's Section Chair Rob Weiner is to respond promptly to actions of the administration that affect civil rights, social justice, and civil liberties. We will accomplish this by offering free webinars, commentary, podcasts, social media posts, and other information from subject matter experts. We will be tweeting from our Twitter handle at ABA underscore CRSJ, posting on our Facebook page, and regularly updating our website, www.americanbar.org backslash CRSJ, with relevant news, webinars, and other projects, like our recent publication, Environmental Protection in the Trump Era, which we co-produced with the Environmental Law Institute and which is available for free download on our website. We now begin today's program, What's Up with the Graham Cassidy Proposal, teaching our Civil Rights and Equal Opportunity Committee co-chair Janelle George of the National Women's Law Center and Mara Udelman of the National Health Law Program. Hey, thank you all so much for joining us today and we're really happy to be here for the inaugural webinar. Um, we're going to start and give sort of an overview of what got us to the point today where we're talking about the Graham-Cassidy proposal. Um, then we'll go into some of the overall substance of the bill and we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers towards the end of the presentation. Um, so to kick us off, it's important that you understand the congressional budget process because that's what got us in large part to where we are this week with a potential vote on the Graham-Cassidy proposal. Um, later this week. The normal congressional budget process is that there are 13 appropriations bills that Congress has to pass and the President has to sign every year and this is what funds the federal government. As part of the budget process, Congress has the authority to adopt what we call reconciliation instructions. If both the House and the Senate adopt a joint budget resolution which outlines what they want to do for the budget process for that year, they can include reconciliation instructions. The goal of reconciliation was really to find ways to streamline addressing um, the overall deficit and how do we reduce the federal deficit. What it's become is a fast-tracked way to make significant changes to potential any legislation or any um, government program. Back at the beginning uh, in January of this Congress, um, they passed a joint budget resolution, so both the House and the Senate agreed to a joint budget resolution for the fiscal year 2017. And what that instruction included were proposals um, to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Now, why does it matter that it's included in reconciliation instructions? Well, it's important to note that in the Senate, um, reconciliation bills are on a fast-track process. Normally in the Senate, in order to bring legislation to the floor, at least 60 senators would have to vote to proceed to debate. Under reconciliation and the special budget process, you only need 50 votes to bring legislation to the floor. It's also very limited in that there's only 20 hours of debate. So given that the Republicans in Congress currently hold 52 seats, they don't have 60 votes, so they couldn't go through normal legislative order because they would have needed 60 votes to repeal the Affordable Care Act. So instead, by including this as part of this joint budget resolution for the current fiscal year, they were able to bring legislation to the floor in a much more expedited manner, only needing 50 votes in the Senate, um, and then also only having 20 hours of debate. So we've seen a lot of activity between January of this year when they adopted this joint budget resolution up until this week to try to find a way to pass repeal of the Affordable Care Act through both the House and the Senate. Now, just to clarify, the budget reconciliation process doesn't give you any special protections in the House, um, but since the House is generally operating under a simple majority rule, it's not as difficult to get legislation through the House of Representatives as it is the Senate. It's always much more challenging to pass legislation through the Senate. So the reason that we're right now discussing the Graham-Cassidy proposal is, you may not have known, but the federal fiscal year actually ends September 30th. And the Senate parliamentarian who rules on all of the rules of the Senate has said that the budget resolution that was adopted back in January that included those instructions to repeal the Affordable Care Act, 
that resolution expires this Saturday. So if Congress and the Senate does not act before this Saturday, they lose those protections um, and they would have to move bills through regular order. Now we'll talk a little bit towards the end of the presentation about what may happen with the new fiscal year that starts on October 1st, but let's first start and focus where we are on the Graham-Cassidy proposal, which is the most recent Republican proposal to try to attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act, but also in large part decimate the Medicaid program. Janelle is going to give you an overview of the state of play of where we are right now, and I'll give you an overview of actually what's in the Graham-Cassidy proposal as of today. Janelle? Thanks so much for that uh, great intro, Mara, and for breaking down the Senate budget reconciliation process uh, in a very clear way. Uh, so as folks know, the Graham-Cassidy proposal introduced by Senators Lindsey Graham uh, and Bill Cassidy uh, was introduced earlier uh, last week. What we saw was late Sunday night, a new version of this bill was posted uh, that unfortunately would be even worse, in particular for women's health, than uh, the earlier version. Normally, uh, before the Senate votes on these kind of budget reconciliation packages, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office would have to do an analysis of the impact of uh, the proposal. Uh, due to the late nature of this proposal, again, it was a, a revised version was posted Sunday night, the Congressional Budget Office, or CBO, didn't have the time necessary to do a full analysis of this bill. Uh, so what we see posted on the CBO's website is just a very broad overview showing that millions would lose coverage under this proposal. It uh, basically meets the minimum standard of what they need to try to move forward uh, with this proposal. Again, this is only the latest of several iterations of attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, and as Mara noted, through the budget reconciliation process. And again, the instructions for 2017 expire on September 30th, which is why you're hearing a lot of talk of moving forward before Friday. I just want to flag again that new proposal came out late Sunday night. CBO could only do a very broad analysis of the impact of the bill. Yesterday, the Senate Finance Committee held a hearing on the bill into questions uh, from a uh, question a few witnesses, and uh, including Senator Cassidy, about the bill. Uh, this morning, I know folks are probably confused by news reports that have come out showing that Senator Collins, Senator McCain, and Senator uh, Paul uh, opposed the bill, which would not bring Republicans the uh, simple majority that they're looking for. Uh, but Again, just because these three folks have announced their public opposition, we're in no way saying that this bill is dead now. It's still important to, uh, for us to highlight the impact that this bill would have on folks and their access to health care and coverage, um, and just to continue to push forward. There, it's not very clear on whether or not we'll see a vote. We could still see a vote as early as Wednesday. We're proceeding as if that's still very much a possibility. And again, I know there are various news reports out there uh, flagging different things for folks, so it's pretty confusing. Uh, but, you know, as we've seen with different ACA repeal proposals, these things come up again and again. And I just want to flag uh, the National Women's Law Center has worked for 45, over 45 years to improve women's lives in various aspects of their lives, including education, economic security, and of course, health care. So in this bill, this proposal, like other similar ACA repeal proposals, would have devastating effects on not only women's health, but their economic security as well. And I know that Mara will talk a little bit generally about um, the provisions in this bill, and then I will talk specifically about the impact that these provisions would have on women's health and economic security. Great. 
Um, so once again, we should just also mention, if you do have questions, we are going to leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end after we do our presentations. Um, on your dashboard, you should see a panel that says questions, and you can type your questions in there, and that's the best way to sort of be able to get your questions into the queue that we can answer them later. Um, so let me also say, because we're doing a very abbreviated discussion of what's in the Graham-Cassidy bill, um, if you take a look at the National Health Law Program's website, um, which is www.healthlaw.org, um, you'll see we've actually put out a number of materials on the Graham-Cassidy proposal. So we've actually done, I think we have four top ten lists. One top ten um, uh, provisions that affect the Medicaid program in Graham-Cassidy top 10 impact on women's reproductive health, top 10 impact on people with disabilities, and top 10 uh, impact on California and the Medi-Cal program in California. Um, we were actually founded in California about 48 years ago, so we historically have a lot of work that we do in California as well. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at, at our website for more information. There also is a statement that we sent to the Senate Finance Committee for their hearing yesterday um, and a couple of blogs as well. But let me walk you through sort of the main provisions of this Graham-Cassidy proposal as it stands now. Um, and as we said, it actually was, was introduced by four senators. So we call it Graham-Cassidy, but it was also um, introduced by Senators Heller and Johnson originally. Um, and I'll be talking about the, the bill as it stands with the latest iteration, which we think is the fourth version. Um, but as Janelle said, the state of play is very open. And so that's why we, we are not saying today that it is dead yet, because they are still trying to make changes to the bill to try to bring on board one of those senators who has said no, um, or to try to find other ways that they might be able to bring this um, to a vote. So it is not over, um, at least this round really, until we get to the 30th. Um, we may hear some developments later that the Senate Majority Leader may decide not to bring the bill to the floor for a vote, um, but really the, the drop dead deadline right now is September 30th, so it's really important that people still stay engaged and, and get informed about this bill because anything really can happen as we've seen in the past with bills we thought were dead but, but came back pretty quickly. Um, so let's go through. I'm going to divide up um, the discussion into two main issues of what happens with the Affordable Care Act and the marketplaces and what happens with Medicaid. Um, as you've probably seen over the last eight months, and certainly during the presidential campaign last year and Senate and congressional campaigns last year, there's been a lot of talk about repealing the Affordable Care Act. Um, and certainly a big chunk of this bill does attempt to um, repeal large sections of the Affordable Care Act. The second piece on making drastic uh, changes to Medicaid was not really in campaign promises at all, but really became a byproduct of this bill, and I think in large part, um, that's where we've seen the most uh, galvanizing support of people who would stand to lose their Medicaid um, protections and their Medicaid coverage, um, and there's 74 million people enrolled in Medicaid at any one time who really depend on that program, often for life or death. Um, and so some of the changes there were, were very dramatic and went much farther than some of the campaign promises. In terms of what it would do for the Affordable Care Act, the Graham-Cassidy proposal would repeal both the individual and the employer mandate. So there would no, be no more requirements to have health insurance or pay a penalty if you didn't have health insurance. It also effectively gets rid of all of the marketplaces. So both the state-based marketplaces as well as the federal, federally facilitated marketplace. So individuals would no longer be able to go at this point to a marketplace to purchase coverage. There would be no tax credits there would be no cost-sharing reduction. So the bill would provide no guarantees of financial assistance to low-income people to purchase health insurance. And that really was a huge feature of the Affordable Care Act, of making health care affordable for many low-income people by targeting the financial assistance to individuals on the lower end of the income scale. Instead, what Graham-Cassidy does is propose a new block grant. And so it would take all of the money that's currently being spent on the Affordable Care Act for the tax credits, for the cost-sharing reductions, as well as for Medicaid expansion, put that all into one pot of money, and divide it up among the 50 states in the District of Columbia. In large part, this is a reallocation. So states that actually chose to expand their Medicaid programs and enroll lots of people in the marketplaces because they were committed to the goals of the Affordable Care Act actually would stand to lose the most um, because the money would be redistributed over all 50 states. So many states that did not expand the Medicaid program 
would actually be huge gainers under this new system and get a lot of block grant money, but states that did expand Medicaid, like California, Illinois, New York, et cetera, would actually lose billions and billions of dollars because money would be taken away from them. The states ultimately would determine how to spend their block grant funds. There's a number of ways that are outlined in the bill. There's about six or seven different ways states could spend it, but there's no guarantees that assistance has to be provided to low-income consumers or underserved communities. So states could choose to set up their own marketplaces. <coughs> Excuse me. They could choose to set up a high-risk pool. They could choose to set up reinsurance to help cover the cost of um, high-cost patients and consumers. They could pay providers. They basically have carte blanche to determine how to set up a healthcare system in their state and do with the block grant money what they want. There's very little uh, federal strictures on this. And that's one of the big problems, is you'd end up with significant variations between states. If we thought it's been confusing under the Affordable Care Act, where some states expanded Medicaid and some didn't, some states set up their own marketplaces, some used the FFM, we really would get to 50 very different systems under the Graham Cassidy proposal. And again, there would be no guarantee that financial assistance would be targeted to low-income individuals. Further, the block grant starts at 17% less funding than is currently being spent on tax credits, cost-sharing reductions, and Medicaid expansion. And that block grant expires after 10 years. So we've got already sort of two strikes on states. Less money to start off with, 10 years of funding and you're done and a very, very short, sorry, this is three strikes, a very short ramp up period, two years, to figure out how to set up a new system or how to spend that block grant money. And it already took us a number of years, as many of you experienced, to set up the Affordable Care Act. This would put huge pressures on the states to come to make a lot of these decisions really quickly and figure out what they were gonna do and get these systems in place. One of the other issues with the Graham Cassidy proposal is it also would allow states to waive many of the really important consumer protections that were at the heart of the Affordable Care Act. So states, for example, could waive the requirements around essential health benefits. And this means, for example, that um, health insurance uh, plans might not cover maternity and newborn care. They might not cover mental health and substance use disorder treatment. There might not be requirements for mental health parity anymore. It also means that we could see the return of annual and lifetime limits. We would have higher deductibles, higher premiums. Further, insurers could charge individuals with pre-existing conditions much higher premiums as well. So many of the pieces of the Affordable Care Act that consumers have really come to rely on to help bring down the cost of insurance and ensure comprehensive coverage would completely be eviscerated by this block grant proposal in the Graham-Cassidy bill. So let me move on to the Medicaid pieces, which again, as I said, was not sort of undergirding the attempts um, or the ideas to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Medicaid got brought in because many of the same people who want to see the Affordable Care Act go away also have had a long-standing desire to rein in Medicaid as one of the big entitlement programs and to find ways to cut spending on Medicaid. Um, the analysis that Janelle mentioned from the Congressional Budget Office found that the Graham-Cassidy proposal would cut one trillion, that's with a T, trillion dollars in Medicaid over 10 years. That is huge. Um, Medicaid expansion would end, as I mentioned. States would no longer be able to get any federal funding through the Medicaid program to cover their Medicaid expansion enrollees. As I said, if a state wanted to pay for those enrollees through its block grant, it could, but it couldn't choose to say, oh, well, we don't get the ACA's sort of higher funding for Medicaid expansion, but will continue to fund them as a regular Medicaid population, uh-uh. States would get zero federal funding to cover Medicaid expansion enrollees, which are usually childless adults who are under 138% of the poverty level. They would get zero federal funding to cover those, those people in um, Medicaid. In addition to eliminating Medicaid expansion, the Graham-Cassidy proposal, similar to the other proposals um, considered by the Senate earlier this summer, would drastically alter the financing of the Medicaid program. The way Medicaid currently acts, it's a federal state partnership with a federal guarantee of funding. For every um, dollar that the state spends, it's going to get matched and it's going to be able to pull down funding from the federal government. Poorer states can pull down more money than, than higher income states. So a state like New York or California gets 50% of its costs paid for by the federal government, 
um, states like Mississippi and Alabama could get 70 or 75 percent of their um, Medicaid expenses paid for by the federal government. Graham Cassidy completely destroys that and gives limited funding under what's called a per capita cap to every state. It becomes very complicated, but basically they add up all the, the Medicaid enrollees in a state, the amount that they spent previously back in 2017 or 2016 or earlier, and they come up with what an, an approximate amount to spend per capita. Now, it wouldn't operate that they say, okay, Mara, you have $2,000, and once uh, Maryland spends $2,000 on you, you're done. Instead, it aggregates all the funding. So it would take Mara's money and Janelle's money and Paula's money and all the money from everyone who's on this phone um, and put it all together and add up those per capita caps. And there might be a different level of funding if you have a disability and a different level of funding if you're a child and a different level of funding if you're a senior. But ultimately, you do these calculations, you come up with a big pot of money, and that's it. And if the state spends more, it doesn't get to draw down any more federal funding. So all of a sudden, we've now put intense pressures on the state by cutting a trillion dollars, but then decide, oh, shoot, are we going to cut eligibility? Are we going to cut services? Are we going to kick kids off the program because we really need to keep our people with disabilities? Our older population is aging and needs more nursing home care. How are we going to save money on, on pregnant women? Things like that. It's going to make it really challenging for states to have to figure out how to provide basic care. In addition, the inflation rate that is included in the Graham Cassidy bill is less than anticipated rises in health care costs. So it's based on the consumer price index in the out years with the consumer price index for medical costs earlier on, but Medicaid costs have often risen higher than that. So you've got to squeeze up front by setting these per capita cap amounts at lower than historical costs. And then your yearly inflation factor doesn't go up as much as healthcare costs. So the, the farther we go out, 5, 10, 20 years, the more we've now squeezed the states and given them less funding to pay for the very vulnerable individuals who rely on the Medicaid program. In addition to the per capita cap, um, states would also have an option to operate part of their Medicaid program, uh, mostly for adults, as a block grant. And so that's even different than a per capita cap. At least in a per capita cap, if you enroll more people, you'd get more money. Under a block grant, set amount of money. Once you spend it, you are over and done. Um, there's also a number of other Medicaid provisions. Um, so, for example, it would reduce funding for what's called the Community First Choice Option, which provides a lot of home and community-based services for individuals who are older or uh, people with disabilities. It also likely would lead to more institutionalization. Um, the way the Medicaid program operates, nursing home care, institutionalization care are mandatory services. Home and community-based services are actually optional. So if a state is squeezed for money, it's going to still have to provide those mandatory services, but it may start cutting back on optional services. So people with disabilities may end up not getting the support they need to live and stay in their communities and may end up having to be institutionalized. It also could lead to longer waiting lists for care. Right now, states have a lot of flexibility to create sort of what we call waiver programs or optional eligibility for people with disabilities and older Americans to give them home and community-based services so they don't end up in institutions. But again, with these financial pressures, states are going to be hard-pressed to provide those optional services or optional eligibility, and they're likely going to ratchet down and cut it back. So we've got a lot of places here where um, attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act have really come um, hard and, and heavy down on the Medicaid program in addition. Um, there's also other provisions in the Graham-Cassidy bill that would eliminate some of the, the pathways to get into Medicaid. So for example, we have things like presumptive eligibility and express lane eligibility, quick and easy ways to help people get started on their Medicaid application, give them temporary eligibility while they're filling out a full Medicaid application those would be gone. Medicaid currently provides three months of retroactive eligibility. So for example, if I apply today on September 26, but maybe I actually had medical bills in the past three months, Medicaid would pay for them. This bill would actually ratchet that down and say only for two months for most Medicaid enrollees would you actually get retroactive eligibility. It also lowers the ability of something we call provider taxes. Many states, almost all states I think except one, help raise the state funding for Medicaid by taxing providers, asking hospitals to help pay for the cost or other Medicaid providers to help pay for the cost that the state in, incurs. Um, this bill would limit the ability of states to um, 
to apply those taxes. And therefore, again, it's another squeeze on the way that, fed, that the states have to come up with their federal share. So overall, this bill would be absolutely horrible for the marketplaces and even worse for the Medicaid program from which 74 million people are relying on their coverage. So I hope I've given you sort of the broad outlines of where this bill stands. I'm going to turn it back to Janelle to speak specifically about the impact on women. Then we'll talk about some of the next steps you'll see over the coming days and then probably months and years and then go to questions. Again, if you have questions, you can type them in the question box um, and we'll get to those in a little bit and I'll turn it back over to Janelle. Thanks so much, Mar, for that great overview. Uh, as, as we both mentioned, the Congressional Budget Office has concluded that millions would stand to lose uh, their health coverage and they would under current law if this proposal were to actually become law. But I really want to highlight the specific impact uh, that the proposal would have on women. Uh, we know based on actually the most recent census data available this month that more than 89.4 million women now have health insurance. Uh, and that's significant, but we also know that an additional 7.2 million women actually gained health insurance coverage just in the years from 2013 to 2016. Uh, that's significant. Uh, so the Affordable Care Act has had a significant impact on women's access to coverage. Mara mentioned that the Graham, Cassidy, Heller, and Johnson proposal also eliminates a lot of the affordability provisions of the ACA. Uh, that will have a significant impact on folks' ability to purchase coverage. Gone are the cost-sharing reductions, gone are the tax credits. Those all go away. Uh, those have been instrumental in particular for women. We know that in 2014, over 9 million women who otherwise would have gone without affordable coverage were actually able to purchase coverage thanks to uh, the tax credits. Uh, also, the cost-sharing reductions, which actually are payments to health insurance issuers uh, to offer more affordable care, actually bring down out-of-pocket costs. One study found that on average, in 2016, cost-sharing reductions helped to reduce uh, out-of-pocket costs for individuals by roughly $1,100 per person. Those are pretty significant uh, cost-sharing reductions, which again, under this proposal, everyone uh, would lose. Mara talked uh, uh, in particular about Medicaid, and I want to talk about the particular impact uh, on women who are enrolled in Medicaid, because women comprise two-thirds of all Medicaid and adult enrollees. In 2016, over 17.4 million women had Medicaid coverage. Uh, the ACA's Medicaid expansion was uh, instrumental in women's access to Medicaid coverage. As Mara also mentioned, uh, single, childless individuals were able to get Medicaid coverage. We know that 4.4 million women gained Medicaid coverage just in the years from 2013 to 2016. And this is critical coverage for things like maternity care, family planning services, long-term care, and other critical supports. So again, the Graham-Cassidy proposal would completely eliminate uh, federal support for the Medicaid expansion. It ends the Medicaid expansion. Uh, and it also ends Medicaid as we know it. As Mara mentioned, one of the things that gives states the option to do not only to convert uh, current Medicaid financing, but it can condition receipt of Medicaid on punitive work requirements. This means that individuals would have to fulfill work requirements in order to receive their Medicaid benefits. They would have to show proof of fulfillment of these requirements. This is an option for states. It has been introduced in other uh, programs such as TANF, we know that work requirements do not actually work. And uh, they have never uh, been imposed for Medicaid. Medicaid is an entitlement program, meaning that if you're eligible, you have access to it. So these work requirements would be very punitive. And we also have to note, particularly this is a civil rights and social justice uh, section, that there are harmful racial stereotypes that underlie these work requirements. And honestly, you know, what we see is often the face of work requirements is a woman uh, of color. 
uh, with children. And it, it's that false narrative of folks need to work uh, when, in fact, the majority of Medicaid enrollees who can work actually do work. Uh, Barr mentioned individuals with disabilities and other folks who are in the program uh, who might otherwise be unable to fulfill work requirements, but the majority of adults who do work, uh, who can work, do actually work, and women most often engage in work that is not recognized, such as caring for their children or uh, being a caregiver for a loved one. So again, states would have the option to impose these punitive work requirements. Um, Mara also mentioned a couple of um, uh, provisions that states would be able to change in terms of the benefits that are, are offered. Uh, and that is a set of 10 required benefits that plans have to cover under the Affordable Care Act called the Essential Health Benefits. Those include maternity coverage. Uh, if passed this prologue, we know that prior to passage of the ACA, most plans did not cover maternity care. And to give folks a sense, uh, pregnancy costs can range from $30,000 for uncomplicated pregnancies to over $50,000 for more complicated pregnancies. So those are very high costs that we know only, according to calculations from the National Women's Law Center, only 12% of the most popular plans on the individual market actually offer maternity coverage. So women pre-ACA were paying these maternity coverage costs out of pocket. Those are significant costs for women and affect not only their health but their economic security. Another significant law, Mar also flagged, but I want to underscore the importance for women's health, is the loss of preventive services. Uh, the ACA really changed the landscape of women's health by offering a package of 10 evidence-based preventive services that are selected by a panel of women's health experts. Uh, they were most recently updated in December 2016. These services include vital services for women's health, such as breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, and birth control. The set of services now, 10 services that are covered, are required to be covered with no cost sharing. So that means no payments, no out-of-pocket costs for women. It has been a game changer for women. Uh, one study found that in 2013, women saved over 1.4 billion with a B dollars on the birth control pill alone. So eliminating these guaranteed uh, guarantees of access to coverage that women need will have devastating repercussions, again, not only just for women's health, but their economic security. We know pre-ACA, uh, the Law Center did extensive research, and we found that women were more likely to completely forego preventive care due to cost. Uh, than men are. So the no cost sharing for these vital preventive services has been instrumental in, uh, again, promoting women's positive health outcomes, but also promoting their economic security. Again, this proposal would end that. So that would be devastating for women's health, and we also know that over 65 million women have pre-existing conditions. As Mara mentioned, uh, the bill would uh, allow health insurance issuers when they're setting their prices to consider someone's health status in setting those prices. So while theoretically the bill might say uh, individuals with pre-existing conditions can't be discriminated against, what will happen in practice is they will effectively be priced out of the health insurance market. Uh, two other significant provisions that will impact women, uh, prior to the conversion of federal funding to block grants in the last two years that will have any tax credits under this proposal. Women are barred from purchasing comprehensive coverage. It includes abortion. Uh, women are also barred from uh, using funds from health savings accounts to purchase comprehensive cl plans that include abortion. In addition, Medicaid enrollees would also be barred from accessing services at Planned Parenthood centers. These are, again, providers of vital preventive care, so uh, STI screenings and treatment, breast cancer screenings. Uh, Medicaid enrollees would not be uh, able to access care at Planned Parenthood centers. CBO actually did an analysis. They have found that uh, under this provision, 
390,000 people will completely lose access to preventive services and 650,000 uh, 650,000 will lose, uh, will have reduced access to preventive services. So these will have significant, all of these provisions collectively will significantly impact access to care. Uh, and again, I just wanted to highlight the particular impact on women. I think oftentimes we forget that before the Affordable Care Act, the individual marketplace was a very discriminatory place for women. Uh, the ACA includes a first broad federal prohibition on discrimination in the health sector. And uh, these are all provisions that for those of us who work in areas of civil rights and social justice, we need to be aware that these are at stake. Uh, in, in, in particular, in this most recent proposal, but we have seen these similar provisions and other proposals to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Great. So in terms of where we are now, just to give a couple of last um, minute things before we get into questions, and again, hopefully you see on your dashboard there's a questions box so you can type your questions in there because I think everyone stays on mute. Um, if you take a look at who opposes this bill, it's, it's pretty amazing the breadth and, and scope of organizations. Virtually every, probably every major medical association from the American Medical Association to the American Academy of Pediatrics, et cetera, has come out in opposition to the bill. America's Health Insurance Plans, which represents the insurers, Blue Cross Blue Shield, have come out in opposition to this bill. Um, all the advocacy groups, all the Medicaid directors, almost half of the governors, um, a good chunk of the state insurance commissioners. So um, you really can see that overall anyone who is involved in providing health care or overseeing public health programs or marketplaces is absolutely opposed to this bill because it's really been rushed through um, without the regular order in the Senate. Normally if you're considering legislation in the Senate, a bill would be introduced, there would be hearings in, in one or more committees, there would be markups of the bill, so a chance to amend the bill. Um, all that would happen over a period of weeks and months. Then a bill would come to the floor of the Senate and have a full debate and also a chance for amendment. None of this has happened. This bill has really been crafted behind closed doors. As Janelle said, we've seen three drafts in the past week, two of which um, were released late on Sunday night right before a hearing on Monday, and there's only been one hearing um, on this bill at all no opportunity for um, a considered uh, development of this bill in hearings and markups and committees. If the bill is actually brought to the floor because of the reconciliation protections, um, as I said earlier, normally there's only 20 hours of debate. Well, all but about 90 seconds of that 20 hours was actually used when the Senate considered the first three ACA repeal bills back in August. Um, so if the bill is brought to the floor, there actually is no official time for debate. Um, except about 90 seconds or so, and then we would go right into what we call votorama, um, where anyone can propose amendments, and you just have like about two minutes of discussion on each amendment, and then a vote on the amendment, and you move on to the others. That goes as long as there are amendments to be considered, um, or until the Senate parliamentarian decides that it's just a delaying tactic and it becomes dilatory and shuts that down as well. Um, so really this is being a rush through very private process, not at all um, compared to when you look at the consideration of the Affordable Care Act, which happened over 13 months. I think there were over close to or over 100 hearings. Um, you know, multiple committees had jurisdiction. The drafts of the bill were out for weeks, if not months, to be considered. So, um, again, a, a lot of the concern has been the process, and you may have seen the statement from Senator McCain saying he actually is not voting for this bill because he believes that this is being rushed and it needs to go through regular order. Uh, Senator Collins also opposes the substance when she came out and said that she was opposed. Um, but a lot, we're still actually, as Janelle said at the beginning, we're, we are not there yet. They're still trying to make changes and anything can happen over the next 12, 24, 72 hours. We really need to just get this to September 30th. Um, what happens after September 30th? Well, there is a chance this could come back again. So as I said, the instructions were in the 2017 budget reconciliation, budget resolution. Uh, if Congress passes a new budget resolution for fiscal year 2018, they could include reconciliation instructions again. We anticipate it would be for tax reform, but um, they actually could include instructions as well to deal with health care. 
So um, we just need to keep pushing to show as the, as the medical associations, the insurers, the health advocates, and all of the consumer polling has shown there is no appetite for repealing the ACA or destroying the financing of Medicaid. Um, people want to see focus on bipartisanship and fixing the Affordable Care Act. Um, we don't need to destroy state economies. Standard and Poor's and Fitch also came out saying this would just result in tons of losses of jobs and devastation to state economies. So really what we'd like to see is, is moving away from the partisan attempts and moving back to a bipartisan process. Senators Alexander, um, a Republican, and Murray, a Democrat, actually had been working for the past three or four weeks on bipartisan fixes to the ACA that got derailed in the last week when Graham Cassidy picked up steam. But there are efforts to move back to that process so that we actually could have efforts to shore up the marketplaces to help improve the Affordable Care Act and to move forward to ensuring that people do really have access to affordable, comprehensive coverage. Uh, do you know anything you want to add before we go to questions? Sure. I just wanted to flag one thing that you uh, raised earlier for folks who joined us a little bit later, and that's that the September 30th deadline, we're calling it the deadline, uh, for the Senate it doesn't apply for the House, of course. And so the Senate is trying to move uh, this out by the 30th before the 2017 budget reconciliations expire. Uh, leaders in the House have said that they will stay and try to pick up whatever the Senate passes. The House would have to pass completely uh, as is whatever passes the Senate. They would not be able to modify it. If they just pass as is, they would not be under the same uh, deadline constraints as the Senate, uh, given the different rules in the, in the House versus the Senate. Uh, again, and as Mara said, we can assume that if the 30th comes and goes, we can't just sit back and say we're done. We still have to expect that there, we could see more reiterations of repeal attempts even after the 30th, whether it's through another attempt through uh, budget reconciliation, uh, through, for the next fiscal year or whether it's through standalone legislation, we have to be prepared to keep, uh, ensure, keep working to ensure, as Mar said, that folks have access to the comprehensive and affordable coverage that they need and that we continue to move forward. So I see that we do have one question again. I'll, I'll get to that question, but if folks also have other questions, please feel free to type those in. Um, Roberto asks, is there a grand or big coalition of organizations that coordinate lobbying efforts? Yes, mm -hmm. and there actually are a number of them. <laughs> um, so Protect Our Care is probably the overarching group that's been coordinating a lot of this work. Um, MoveOn.org has also been coordinating a lot as well as Indivisible uh, helping to create a lot of state activities. Depending on where you're located, um, I think just about every state has state coalitions and health advocates working on these issues. At the national level, we're involved in different uh, coalitions as well. There's uh, a lot of the women's groups have been working together. There's a consortium of citizens with disabilities that's been doing a tremendous amount of effort, particularly to really educate the importance of Medicaid for people with disabilities, um, as well as the Affordable Care Act. Um, the National Health Law Program actually co-chairs the Health Care Task Force of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Um, the National Women's Law Center, where Janelle works, also is uh, uh, an active member of the Leadership Conference. We just sent up a letter opposing Graham Cassidy, signed by 230 organizations, really focusing on the civil and human rights issues. Um, so there's a lot of organizations, and we do all collaborate to make sure that the, the messaging has been the same, and then the lobbying is being done by different groups depending on where they have actions. There's also been tremendous amount of work at the state level with state actions, um, letters to the editor, state campaigns, state advertisement as well. Yeah, one thing I would add to that too, uh, Roberto, is this is a great forum, right, to talk about healthcare as a civil right or healthcare as a human right. Uh, I actually don't think that, that the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice section or the ABA has a position in terms of healthcare as a civil right. Uh, but I think for us, again, uh, who are focused on civil rights and social justice, having just a broad framework about the importance of access to affordable coverage uh, for folks and, and framing this as a civil rights issue is very critical. Uh, and so for folks who are interested in working on a policy, I, I really encourage folks to uh, follow up with Paula Shapiro 
who has helped done a great job with coordinating, facilitating this uh, rapid response project. But uh, it's important for us as me members of the American Bar Association to speak out as well. So that's something I really encourage uh, members to do. We have to have, this is something we have to have a position on. As Mara said, there, there are bipartisan efforts uh, really at work on the Hill to move forward. So this is not, this is something that I think is broadly a civil rights issue. And even if we just look at the Medicaid program, I think about 58% of the Medicaid enrollees are people of color. So this is a huge issue uh, for people of color, for people with disabilities who rely on the Medicaid program. LGBTQ individuals gain huge advantages under the Affordable Care Act by these new pathways into Medicaid because oftentimes they were ineligible under traditional Medicaid categories, but the new Medicaid expansion gave them pathways in. So it's a civil rights issue on many different levels as well um, for all of the populations that we all are working for and, and work on behalf of. Yeah, um, I would just add to that for women because Medicaid is not attached to employment. It has enabled women to uh, have the health coverage that they need, but to continue to seek uh, and pursue their career and uh, educational goals as well. So Medicaid is broadly, uh, has really been instrumental in ensuring that folks have access to the coverage that they need, uh, and it's affordable, it's accessible for folks. So again, this does have broad implications for a variety of populations. And someone else just chimed in, I'm sorry I can't say who, about how the National Indian Health Board in D.C. sent out a legislative action alert um, with some key messages specifically regarding tribes and Native Americans, and that's also been an issue. Senator Murkowski has been a big target of this in large part. Um, she opposed earlier versions of the bill in part because what it may have done for Alaska Natives um, and the Indian Health Service up there, and that's also been a consideration for some of the other senators um, with large Native American or Alaska Native populations in their states as well. Yeah, and Can I have just a... want to mention, mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, just wanted to flag the children's uh, health insurance program as well. We know that we were looking at a September 30th deadline for reauthorization of that for CHIP. Uh, we, I have heard lately, and again, we're hearing different things about <laughs> things moving in health care, uh, but it's possible that could be moved to December. Uh, there are different news reports that states have funding for another year. That's not the case across the board. We know that states have already instituted waiting lists for many of their health insurance programs, children's health insurance programs. So we, again, I think it's very important. We in D.C. have really been urging uh, members to move forward with reauthorization of CHIP. Again, we have bipartisan reauthorization. A proposal was released uh, by Finance Committee uh, members, uh, 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 Chairman Hatch, Ranking Member Wyden. Uh, so that is something, again, that's a bipartisan uh, piece that's moving forward. So we hope that that does continue to advance because we know the critical importance of CHIP as well. So I'm not sure if there's any other questions at this point. If you have them, please feel free to type them into the box. Don't think there are at this point. Um, I think overall, you know, what we really hope that um, we've encouraged you to do is to, to stay engaged in this process, is to monitor what is happening with this bill, but also other attempts as we move forward um, that likely will come up again in the coming year um, to repeal the Affordable Care Act or to restructure the financing of Medicaid. We really would like to see this pivot to more bipartisan efforts as we've just discussed. There's opportunities on CHIP. There's opportunities to stabilize the marketplaces. There's opportunities to make some gains in other areas in health as well um, and to really see if we can move away from the more partisan efforts that we've seen over the last eight months and the, the failure to sort of work in an open and transparent way. Um, but it isn't over. Um, and we really do need to work uh, very hard over the next coming days up until and through the 30th to make sure that this bill is not passed by the Senate. Um, so even though we do have three public uh, statements saying that they oppose the bill again, people are make, trying to make changes and twist arms and get new deals. Um, and uh, it, it ain't over till it's over. So we do encourage folks to stay engaged and to um, continue their efforts, hopefully, to let their senators know what their opinions are, let their Congress uh, representatives know what their opinions are as well. 
I don't know, um, Janelle, if you have any last thoughts, or Paula, we should turn it back to you to, to close out. Mm-hmm. I just echo what you said, Mara. Uh, again, these, uh, this latest proposal and, and others like it will have broad implications for folks' access to the affordable health coverage that they need. So we just encourage folks to continue to stay engaged on this, to stay vigilant on it. We can't rest now. We can't rest after the 30th. We have to stay uh, really engaged on this. And thanks for so many folks who turned out uh, pretty short notice for this rapid response, uh, uh, w- the first rapid response webinar. This is great, and we encourage folks uh, to stay engaged with the section uh, and to work uh, to help us move forward with the policy on access to health care. And Paula, Paula do you have any closing we'll hand it over to you. <laughs> Thank you both so, so much for an incredibly great overview and conversation about what is happening with this proposal and in general. Um, you are right that we currently don't have any policy that states healthcare um, is a civil right or should be. And so if anyone in our audience um, wants to assist us in the in our efforts to draft and pass that policy in, in the ABA and then advocate on our behalf, on that behalf, um, we welcome you to join us. Um, we will be providing in the next few days um, a catalog of all of the current ABA policies related to various topics, and healthcare is one of them. So um, we encourage you to take a look at what policies we do have, and if you see um, a gap and have an idea for a policy that is necessary um, in this fight to um, for healthcare please email us and let us know um, and work with us to develop this policy. And we're, again, Janelle and Mara, we're so grateful. This is a great program, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everyone who was able to join today. Thank you.